Hi all, I'm Professor Dragonovich from the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine um, and welcome to this short presentation um, in which we'll uh, run through the, uh, the foundations of screening um, as it relates to um, the Year 4C Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Unit. So as always, here are our objectives for Module 1. Um, so after this uh, particular unit, hopefully you should be able to uh, define what screening is um, identify the, um, the benefits and risks associated with it, as well as um, recognising the implications of biases um, within the screening context. So what is screening? So I guess we want to start off by just, I guess, differentiating between testing and screening. So when we're talking um, about testing, um, we're, we're referring to running diagnostic tests um, in the presence of symptoms or either to confirm the presence or the absence of a disease. So for example, um, you might have a 45-year-old a male who visits um, his general practitioner because he's getting up two to three times a night to urinate. So you might do a PSA test um, to investigate what the issue may be there from a, um, a prostate point of view, um, whether it's um, BPH, um, prostatitis, um, prostate cancer, any of those um, issues is where um, PSA testing uh, may be uh, relevant. We um, look at screening, I guess, from the other viewpoint in the sense that we're still conducting a test, um, but the main difference is obviously we're conducting that test in the absence of any symptoms. So what types of screening are there? So there's really three broad types of screening. Um, the first being opportunistic um, or, or case finding. So <clears throat> you may find um, an example where a gentleman comes and decides that you know, um, he, he needs a, um, a general health checkup, um, in which part um, an opportunistic thing may be to include a uh, PSA test. Um, if the uh, gentleman meets the um, specific uh, requirements in terms of age and, and history. Uh, selective screening, um, as the name suggests, we're screening those in a, or, well, screening those with the specific criteria. So an example of this may be um, screening for breast cancer using mammography um, and specifically targeting women 50 to 69, so a specific age bracket um, in which to um, target the um, uh, the screening. Um, and then when, of course, we've got the, the third option, uh, that being mass screening. So as the name suggests, um, it's uh, screening across the entire population. Uh, I haven't got a huge number of examples of mass screening, uh, but one good example is um, neonatal screening and, and um, in particular the, uh, the Guthrie test um, for, for all newborns. So what are some potential benefits and limitations of screening? Um, so uh, a lot of people, when, when they think about benefits of screening, and, and quite often when they're presented um, you know, through advertisements about screening, um, will focus on the benefits, that being you know, um, early detection um, leads to early treatment of the disease, um, in which case you know, the, the number of treatments uh, available um, are increased. <coughs> Um, it also increases the psychological well-being, as you could imagine. So um, you go off and you, know, you screen for a particular um, uh, disease, um, comes back negative, you feel good about yourself. Downplay that with the um, potential limitations. Um, so of course, um, depending on how long the test's uh, results uh, take to come back, um, there's also that anxiety associated with it. So that, psychological well-being is a two-edged two sword, um, but there are also um, specific limitations around over-diagnosis and potentially over-treatment. Um, the, 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 the impact of interval disease, um, and then of course um, uh, the false uh, results around false positives and negatives. However, one of the other things that people don't really take into consideration um, at the onset when, when, when we're talking about screening is I guess the downstream effects around treatment and potential side effects or, or adverse events um, associated with um, potentially invasive um, uh, treatment regimes. 
So to screen or not to screen, um, and I guess this slide is just to demonstrate how evidence can affect, well, policy to a certain extent, but also the way in which we advertise um, screening. So this is a um, the the slogan and, and advertising uh, from uh, from the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. <clears throat> Uh, several years ago, so probably about six to eight years ago, uh, they had a, a Be A Man campaign. So Be A Man uh, with a byline, get screened for prostate cancer. If you have a look at their current um, logo and byline, um, they still run with the, uh, the Be A Man uh, logo, um, but a subtle difference. Um, rather than saying get screened for prostate cancer, um, they're promoting talk to your doctor about prostate cancer. And so here's a, a, a really, um, a, I guess, neat example of um, EBCP, so evidence-based clinical practice, uh, making a change um, in the real world um, and, and how um, it can potentially impact upon um, patient outcomes. So I just wanted to cover a, a couple of quick topics um, before we before we wrap up in this presentation. The first one being overdiagnosis, um, and this is a term that you'll often hear when people talk about uh, screening programs as one of the potential uh, limitations. Um, and and so overdiagnosis is basically picking up, um, or let's say we're talking about you know, screening for cancer, picking up slow-growing cancers that wouldn't um, otherwise have become clinically apparent, they wouldn't have been clinically relevant. So, so to some extent, they're, they're almost, you know, your, your false positives in the sense that you're picking up um, cancers that, you know, someone wouldn't have known um, that that would have been an issue. And, and prostate cancer is the, um, the, the classic example with this. Um, there are a number of other examples, um, breast cancer, um, non-cancer non examples around um, asthma and ADHD as well. So the one that I, I wanted to compare notes on was um, uh, comparing Finland versus Australia um, uh, before any modifications uh, with respect to uh, cervical cancer screening. So in this particular table we've got um, the impact of overdiagnosis relating to cervical cancer screening um, when we compared Finland as opposed to Australia from a few years ago in terms of their um, uh, recommendations. So Finland um, would recommend, um, uh, the, the clinical practice guidelines will recommend that women at the age of 30 um, begin um, their screening for, for um, cervical can uh, cancer with um, the pap smears and stop um, at the age of 60 um, and only be screened every five years. So in essence, their, their lifetime exposure to being screened is, you know, if you stick to the guidelines, seven times. We compare to what was being promoted here in Australia. Um, and so they would recommend um, screening at the age of 18 um, or, 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 or the first time um, of sexual intercourse um, and stopping at the age of 70 um, with a screening interval of two years. So you, you have a look at um, the lifetime exposure to screening um, and it's almost as four times as high um, in Australia as it was uh, in Finland. So what was the impact? So we were screening more so here in Australia than we were in Finland. Um, however, the most common cancer um, in this instance takes 10 years to develop. Um, and the really sort of um, uh, end, end note um, to it was that regardless of whether we were screening four times as more frequently or potentially four times as more frequently as the um, Finnish. Um, there was the same incidence and mortality rates um, between the two countries. Um, now, I, I guess to consider, um, these recommendations were all based on, on observational studies at the time. So again, this throws up another um, issue around when do you need to act upon evidence and at what level, whether it be cohort study, observational or um, experimental. But um, I'll leave it up to you guys to, to investigate further to see, to see how, um, how much um, or how little uh, things have changed in the meantime with respect to um, uh, clinical practice guidelines and screening for cervical cancer here in Australia. So to offset I guess, overdiagnosis, I want to touch briefly on interval cancers. 
Um, so we can almost think of them, if we thought of overdiagnosis as false positives, we can think of interval cancers as false negatives. So basically interval cancers are, are those cancers, if we're, if we're thinking about a cancer screening program, that occur between uh, the screening rounds. So the question is asked, how do you overcome interval cancers? Well, increase the frequency of screening uh, rounds. Um, but in doing so, you increase the chances potentially of overdiagnosis and hence this continual struggle to find a balance between uh, the number of screening rounds um, in terms of to, to realise the, the true benefits of screening as opposed to um, any harms or limitations that may be associated with um, um, ident well, not, up, not being able to identify interval um, disease or cancers. So this uh, last slide, I just want to demonstrate um, that, that um, effect in terms of the, the screening for cervical cancer in Finland versus um, um, Australia at the time. So um, if we look um, here on the x-axis, we've got age. Um, on the uh, y-axis, we've got screening in interval. So here we've got um, Australia screening every two years. Um, and as you can see, from the age of 18 to 20, 22, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we look at um, uh, the Finnish population, uh, they were screening much later in time um, and over um, uh, a longer uh, screening interval. Now, th this is where the balancing act comes into play. Um, do we go every two years, um, as per uh, the Australian context, risk overdiagnosis, or do we go every five years um, and risk um, any cancers developing in this um, interval um, because it's it's a larger interval of five years. So the final thing that I, I just wanted to flag with you guys is, um, I guess, identifying the characteristics that make up a good screening test. So in order to identify whether or not um, we're, we're going to implement a, um, a screening test or a screening regime, whether it be um, at an individual or population level, um, we want to keep these um, uh, key, key criteria in the back of our mind. So the first one, the test needs to be safe. Um, so it goes without saying that benefits need to outweigh any potential harm. It needs to be simple. So the, the simpler the test is, um, the more easier it is, um, the more uh, likely it's going to be implemented and, um, and interpreted uh, correctly. Uh, reliability is a given, um, so it should give consistent results um, regardless of which environment it's being um, implemented in. Um, it should be accurate and valid. So obviously your, your, your sensitivity and specificities um, in, in this particular um, instance, it should be highly sensitive um, and, and hopefully um, highly specific. It's not often that you'll get both, but um, you know, if we're looking up um, characteristics of, of an ideal test, um, this is what it would look like. So that's the end of it from me for this time. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. I um, hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you.